Okay, today we're going to take a look at something known as port forwarding or port tunneling. Personally, I call it port tunneling, but a lot of people will refer to it as port forwarding. And this is something that I've needed to do on a couple of Hack the Box machines already. So rather than having to keep explaining it in every video where I use it, I figured I would put together this separate standalone video that goes into it in a lot more detail and a better explanation. And then I can just refer people to this instead of covering it every time. So we're going to start off by just going through kind of a conceptual overview of how this all works with a little slideshow that I've made. And then we're going to look at a real world example of how you would actually perform this. So to get started, let's say we've got our attacker machine here, which obviously we control and we can run whatever we want on. And we've got this target machine this server that is running a service on it that we want to connect to. And for this example, it's going to be the PowerShell remoting service. So this service is going to be listening on port 5985 for any incoming network connections. And in an ideal world, we would just be able to run the PowerShell client on our own machine, connect over the network on port 5985, which in PowerShell you do with uh, the enter ps session command, but that's kind of irrelevant for this discussion. And that's something I need to point out straight away is that this isn't specific to PowerShell. This, this technique, this port forwarding thing will work with any network connection, any kind of network client or service that's listening on a certain port. This will work with pretty much anything. There's bound to be some exceptions, but for the most part, this will work with anything. So just bear in mind that we're only using PowerShell and port 595 as an example here, just so we've got some numbers and some actual kind of names of executables and stuff to work with. But yeah, you can substitute whatever port numbers and whatever client and server program you want. So yeah, in an ideal world, like I said, we would be able to connect with PowerShell on port 595 to the remote machine and get our remote PowerShell session. But what if there's a firewall that stops that connection? Or what if the service that we're trying to connect to has only been configured to listen on the local IP address? It won't actually accept incoming connections from remote IP addresses. So those two scenarios are the kind of problem that we're trying to solve with port forwarding here. Firstly, a firewall blocking the incoming connection. And secondly, the service that we're trying to connect to only listening for connections from other programs running on the same machine as it. And before we go any further, one important thing that you're going to need as a prerequisite for this is to already have the ability to execute some code on the target machine. So you need to be able to run programs on the target machine. Now you might think, well in that case, why do we need to get a remote connection anyway? If we've already got a reverse shell running on the uh, target machine, why can't we just use that to connect to the local service? Well, in my experience, again using PowerShell as the example, if you have, say, a Netcat reverse shell running on the remote machine, and you try and do like enter ps session to start a new powershell session as a different user through the netcat reverse shell it doesn't tend to work very well in fact it doesn't seem to work at all another example of why we can't do this sometimes is for example once i was attacking an ftp service and the way to attack it was to use the admin interface which is like a graphical program you could run on windows and that connected to like the admin service but there was no command line interface for that it had to be done through this graphical program and obviously we can't run that from like a netcat reverse shell or anything like that so we need a way to be able to run the graphical program on our attacker machine and connect it over the network to the admin service the admin service in that case was only listening for connections on the local machine so there's two quick examples of why you might want to do this let's take a look at how we can actually achieve this then so like I said, we've already got the ability to run whatever program we want on the target machine. Now I actually wrote my own program to do this, but there are plenty of alternatives. There's one uh, off the shelf program already called Chisel, which I think you can use on Linux and Windows. Uh, there's the Metasploit framework has got its own built-in port forwarding system. But yeah, I just fancied understanding this a bit better and kind of teach myself something. So I wrote my own program, which we're gonna call PT.exe, PT standing for port tunnel. And we're gonna run that on the remote machine. But what we're also going to do is run it on our attacker machine in like a different mode. I mean, it could be a separate executable, but I just made it all in one. I think Chisel is all just in one as well. You just specify different command line arguments when you run it to kind of determine which end of the uh, tunnel it's on. Now, if this program just tried to connect from the attacker machine to the target machine on some different port and then pass the traffic on to port 595 locally, that wouldn't work because, again, the firewall is going to block that. But luckily for us, most firewalls aren't going to block any outbound traffic at all. They only care about inbound traffic. And even if they were blocking most outbound ports, they're generally going to allow like port 80 outbound just for web traffic. But what that means is that we can create an outbound connection from the target to us. And by default in my program, it uses port 9966, but you can specify whatever port number you want. The port number doesn't really matter, like I say, unless the firewall is actively blocking certain ports, and then you can just choose one that it's not blocking. But so far, whenever I've used this, I haven't had any problems with port 9966 being the one that it uses. So we create this outbound connection, which gets through to our machine fine. And the reason that that's useful is because TCP connections, once they're established, are actually two-way. So this is what it actually looks like now. We can send data in either direction whenever we want, and the firewall doesn't get involved because it was an outbound connection to begin with. So you can probably start to see where this is going. What we're going to do is instead of connecting PowerShell over the network to port 5985 on the remote machine, we're going to connect PowerShell to our own machine. 
and the PT executable is going to pick up that connection and send it over the network across this port 9966 to the PT executable running on the target. So now in PowerShell we'll just do like enter PS session local host instead of specifying the IP address of the remote machine. That will connect on port 5985 to our PT executable that's listening on port 5985. Again you specify the port that you want to forward in the command line arguments when you launch it. But let's just assume we specified port 5985. So that accepts the incoming connection from the PowerShell executable and any data that is sent down that connection it will just pass on, it will just copy all of the bytes that it receives send them down port 9966 to the executable on the target machine that's listening for that. And then when this PT executable receives it at the other end, it will send those bytes to whatever's listening on port 5985 on its own machine. Now, in reality, I've shown these arrows are just kind of one way, but they are bi-directional, just like the connection over port 9966. So all those arrows that just appeared, going from PowerShell to PT, across the tunnel to PT on the other end, and then up to the service that's listening on port 5985, all of those can flow in both directions because obviously the PowerShell service needs to send data back to the PowerShell client for it to be of any use. So data can flow in both directions. And by doing all of that, we've just completely bypassed the firewall. And also if this service that was listening on the target machine was only listening for connections on the local machine, then we've bypassed that restriction as well because pt.exe that's running on the target is obviously running on the same machine as the service that's listening. So any traffic that it forwards on will always appear to come from the local machine to that target service. But anyway, let's take a look at this in real life, in action, and see what it actually looks like. So for this demonstration, we've got PowerShell running on my own local machine here. Um, so this would be the attacker machine in that diagram that we were just looking at. Then this netcat reverse shell here is running on the remote machine. So if we just type post name, we'll see the remote machine is called desktop something or other. And my own local machine here is WSO2. So these two things are running on two separate machines, basically. And this is obviously the target machine that we're trying to attack. But if we just try to connect with PowerShell now, if we just do enter PS session, type in the IP address of the remote machine that we're trying to connect to, and we'll supply some credentials. Um, HTBC is the username that we want to connect to. We put in their password. So those are valid credentials for this remote machine. But this will eventually time out because the firewall is not allowing the connection through on port 5985, which is the port that this enter PS session command will actually use in the background. I'll skip forward to when this is timed out. So there we go, we see it failed because uh, it cannot complete the operation, verify that the computer name is valid. We know that the IP address is valid, so basically the reason is the firewall blocked it. It does actually even mention here, make sure there's a firewall exception for the WinRM service. So, because we've already copied over the PT executable, it's just in the root of the C drive, we run that, we'll see the help text that I wrote into the program. But yeah, long story short, we need to just do pt.exe dash s because this is the server side, and then specify the IP address that we want it to make that outbound connection to. So if you remember on the diagram, the target machine needs to make the outbound connection to bypass the firewall to our machine. So we'll do my IP address, which is 192.168.0.51. And then the port that we want to forward is going to be that 5985, which is actually the one that I used in the example text as well. So if we run that, that's going to try and create an outbound connection to us. And you can see it's using that port 9966 there. What we need to do on my machine is start this port tunnel program as well. So you see it's actually failed there to connect because the listener wasn't ready. So we'll just start this. And all we need to do on this machine is just say the port that we're going to forward. So this is on, again, on the attacker machine in that diagram. This is where we're running this. So we just run PT. It's going to say that it wants to be allowed through the firewall, which is fine for us. So now this is waiting for that connection on port 9966. So now if we run this again, it will successfully connect and it says it's waiting for data. And you'll see on our end, yeah, it's all ready, it's all waiting for data. So now what we can do in our local PowerShell client is just connect to the local machine instead. So we'll change that IP address there. Instead of connecting to the remote machine, we're just gonna to connect to our own machine, so local host. And this program here that's running is gonna pick up that connection because it's listening for connections on port 5985. And then it will forward it over port 9966 to the remote machine, and then everything should just work. So we'll put in the password again, and we'll see this is now sending the data between the two machines, and we're now connected. You'll see that PowerShell actually thinks we are connected to the local host, but if we do hostname, you'll see that we're actually running on that remote machine, because again, hostname on my local machine was not that. So again, we could look around the C drive and do everything that we could normally do, and this is all running on the remote machine, despite PowerShell thinking we're connected just to our own local machine. Again, the initial connection to the remote machine just failed because the firewall was blocking it, whereas now it works perfectly. If you do try this yourself, uh, one thing I did have to do was stop the PowerShell services on my own machine, 
because obviously they are normally listening for port 595. Uh, so when you try and run port tunnel, it'll complain that it can't listen on that port. Because again, here, when we connect to local host, we need the port tunnel program to pick up that connection, not the actual legit PowerShell services running on our machine. That wouldn't be a, an issue with some other services and stuff. It's only because the, the remote PowerShell system is built into Windows, so it was already running on my machine. But yeah, if you're attacking some other kind of service, you probably won't have that issue. Um, but yes, yeah, so you can see my program here is running through, just passing on however many bytes. I would assume that every um, few seconds PowerShell sends like a keep alive packet, which is what we're seeing there. Um, but you'll see when I actually run a command, if we do ls, it has to take all that data, send it across, and then it gets the response back. Um, it's not particularly well optimized, this program. I'll show you the code very briefly. It's kind of just, it took me a long time to actually get it working at all. And so once it did work, I kind of just left it alone. But yeah, there's a lot of like array copies and stuff that could be optimized and done in a better way, I'm sure. But for now, it works. Um, it took me quite a while to, to get it all working, like I said. So I'm kind of happy that it works. I'm going to expand on it um, with a, a user interface as well. So it's a bit easier to use and has some other functionality. But for now, yeah, that's uh, that's what it is. I'm not going to go through all the code because for a start, I can't even remember how I've made half of it work because it was a while ago. And secondly, it would be very tedious going through all this code. There's a lot of multi-threading and stuff going on as well, so it gets a bit complicated. But I mean, at the end of the day, if I can write it, I'm sure a lot of other people could do the same thing. And also, as I mentioned before, there are off-the-shelf programs that you can use that work on Linux as well. So it's not like you have to write your own program and you don't have to use my program. I guess I should put this up for download um, if somebody wants to download it. But yeah, like I said, because I'm not finished kind of tweaking it and optimizing it, I haven't done that yet. But if you really want a copy of it, bear in mind it only works on Windows. It needs .NET Framework 4 installed. Um, but yeah, if you really want a copy of it, let me know and I'll stick it up for download somewhere. But yeah, for now, that is it. Hopefully that explains how this all works. Hopefully you learned something. And uh, yeah, maybe you can use it in a future Hack the Box machine.